Rocky Crew. Daenerys be the name, and I'm setting hearts aflame when I'm burning down these villages and freeing all the slaves. Wiz Khaleesi, have you bit my dragons? My brother tried to sell me to Khal Drogo, look what happened. A bit hot-headed with that molten golden crown. I stopped the Kalisar, so don't be messing with me now. Look my lover in the eye, winter's coming, so am I. I burned the witch alive, but took my son and husband's lives. But I survived so frisky, now these dragons have my back. Suitors are so frisky, and they always try to mac. Zara, Zoe, and Daxos had to lock him in a vault. Made my way to Slaver's Bay, but it was not my fault. It was karmic retribution. There was no preparing them when Crisis tried to mess with the wrong Targaryen. I smarted him like Tyrion when I knew how Valyrian. These creatures on my shoulders, well, I think you should be fearing them. You, you, you are now watching the throne. I got dragon blood. What you want to do, son? I got dragon blood. What you want to do? I got dragon blood. What you want to do, son? Because I'm always going hard with my the Cracky crew. I got dragon blood. What you want to do, son? I got dragon blood. What you want to do? I got dragon blood. What you want to do, son? Because I'm always going hard with my the Cracky crew. Thracky the Thracky, unsullied behind me, like I'm Luminati. It's the mother of dragons with my gigantic army. We be marching to Marine, but no, we didn't come to party. Cause they crucified the slaves and put them on the cross. So Jorah, please get lost. I know you think I'm hot. My schedule's kind of busy, got no time for Perryayin. White girl politic, and that's Daenerys Palin. From Dorne to the Stormlands, the north and beyond. To the Westlands and Essos, I'm keeping it strong. From the Crownlands to the Reach, you know I'm getting love. To the Riverlands and back, because I've got that dragon blood. So follow more cool. I thought that you knew this, but dragons are people, you know we've been through this. I'm quick to burn a hater, no mercy, damn just smacking kings in the face like my name was Cersei Lannister. Burn, burn, you should gonna burn. 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 I got dragon blood, what you wanna do, son? I got dragon blood, what you wanna do? I got dragon blood, what you wanna do, son? Cause I'm always going hard with my god, crazy crew. I got Hello, 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 everyone. Uh, this is Grandmaster Art on Actions, and I'm very happy to stream from Finland. Can you imagine? I'm not streaming from Riga, where I'm usually doing my uh, educational streams on Fridays, which is the bootcamp, my uh, bootcamp on various topics where I try to present. Yeah, thank you for the hydrate. That was quick. First 10 seconds. That's a new record, actually. All right here we go and uh yeah so today is a quite a special day because it's been exactly half a year when i last was flying with a plane and today finally i flew to finland i'm going to participate in finnish team championships which starts tomorrow and please don't tell anybody if you know some finnish anyway I wouldn't want to miss my bootcamp for whatever reason, so I'm still here, I'm gonna do this, so thank you that you are gonna watch it, and let's go on. Right, so today's topic is uh, studying the opposite color bishop endgames, and uh, so I would like to show you some very interesting examples, which I think are quite crucial. To understand these obstacle bishops better and i hope you'll remember something so if you have some questions please shoot them fire away ask them and i, I think it's very important important for me also to hear your thoughts what do you understand what you don't understand and we'll see how it will go all right all right why people are slowly gathering yeah by the way i apologize i sort of missed for half an hour i think yeah i originally had scheduled it half an hour before but i had to carry uh what was it a uh, washing machine 
<laughs> I got diverted, uh, and I thus had to had to be late. Anyway, I want to show some very simple uh, simple examples of popsicle bishops, and uh, so that we can try to understand what is going on here. Right. Okay. So let's start with something basic. Right. Uh, this is the game between Alexandra Lehin against Edward Lasker, not Emmanuel Lasker, another Lasker. And uh, in this game, black is having two extra pawns. Alehin was playing with white, but it's a rather simple defense because here the king goes in the right corner. Supposedly, this is the so-called wrong corner because if the pawn, the black pawn, is gonna advance to h1. I mean, there's just no way to do it. We just position the king in the corner and we are going to simply give up the bishop on d3. As simple as that. This is an easy draw. Okay, but I had to show it. Let's switch to the next example. I have a lot of more difficult ones, so I'm going to start with some basics. Perhaps for somebody it's not really that easy. Well, for me it is, but maybe for somebody it's not. Uh, this is also quite a typical theoretical draw. And the point is that white cannot advance the one of the passed pawns towards the queen by not losing both pawns. The uh, situation would be different, for example, if he would have, let's say, a blocked pawn here and here. Let's say on a2 is a white pawn and on a3 is a black pawn. That changes the evaluation of position completely. But here we specifically, we have two pawns. And after king e6 here, king f7 here, here. The whole idea is obviously for the bishop to stay on this diagonal, never to go on e7. Otherwise, after c7, we would lose the bishop. We would lose it for good. And thus, white has nothing better to do than to play e7, c7. And although white wins the bishop, this is an easy draw. Okay, so that's quite simple stuff. Let's move on to something more, perhaps slightly difficult, about the connected pass pawns. Uh, about the connected pass pawns, it really depends, right? There are so many positions, so many variants uh, where you can try to get them. But typically the best defense for the defensive, defensive side is to position the bishop right uh, beside the king. So a wrong approach would be to position the, bing he the, the bishop here, right? Because with white, I'm threatening to play d6, king d5, e6, e7, and try to promote. Of course, I don't want to play d6 to trade the pawns for the bishop, bishop because, of course, with the sole bishop, it is impossible to win the game. And the point is why it's so important to keep the bishop on this diagonal. I mean, we can just play bishop c7, bishop b8, bishop c7, bishop b8, because the white king cannot go to c6 to make d6 happen, because the pawn on e5 is lost. So there is just no way. So white is going to go something like king e4, king e5. Black is just sitting and waiting nothing, sitting and waiting nothing. And at some moment, white has to push forward and trade the bishop e6 gives nothing obviously okay let's for example let's say it here e6 is nothing because this is an ideal blockade for the defensive side and there's just no way to make a progress because we are simply moving with the bishop here 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 and that's it okay but i think it was quite important to start with this because these are the basic examples and in some of the occasions you'll you'll need them uh why many people are afraid to go for the obstacle or bishop pen games because essentially there is a quite big drawing tendency um, i have to say many people are mistaken they do believe that as soon as let's say we reach a position uh, let's say not only the bishop pen game because today specifically i'm going to talk about the bishop pen game obstacle or bishops and that's it but Let's say we are reaching a position, I have a queen, and we have bishops. And uh, the other side believes there is a drawish tendency because we have these obstacle bishops. It cannot be further from the truth. There are still other pieces on the board, 
and while exactly opposite color bishop endgames have a high drawing tendency it's not always like that uh, this is quite a unique position actually here black has what is it three extra pawns but the problem is all of them are blockaded which is the best strategy uh, for the defending side he tries to block the pawns on the color of his bishop and for the stronger side which is in this case black he always tries to avoid placing his pawns on the color of his pawns of his bishop uh, the reason is because here specifically white can simply block the pawns and there is just no progress so if you would ask this position uh to a computer it would say it's almost plus two for black but it's it's an easy draw hi sleepy mario um i i don't know if i agree to that i think actually in general people are so much better in defending today than they were some time ago listen i'm gonna switch some light i hope it's fine it's getting dark here i did not test it though how do i switch your light <laughs> i wish i knew i don't know listen i'm gonna sw switch some light here just a second i'm here don't run away um. okay this is bad <clears throat> I, I did not have so much time to prepare, obviously, because I'm streaming from hotel. I'm technically apartments, but I've stayed here so many times, never streamed before. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, so Sleepy Mario answering your question. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. I wouldn't miss it for anyway. Uh, yeah, I'm playing in the league. I'm playing in the league. Uh, Pre-computer artistic side you know i would say like this pre-computer er era uh you could probably better study the games because they were more one-sided let's say you want to study some classical ideas for example how to um exploit an outpost how to exploit a weakness create a second weakness in modern chess it's becoming more and more difficult because the overall level of the defense of the understanding of chess rules has increased dramatically everybody knows how to play everybody has access to many books and databases and online courses and videos on youtube and you name it uh, so it's much much more difficult so for example you would want you would want to study some specific idea it's much more difficult to find it in a modern game because it's multi-complex with a mix of many ideas because both players know how to fight they know how to properly defend how to fight for the initiative and it's much more difficult to filter just the sole idea so this is why a good coach typically suggests study the classics so i mean i sort of that was the long answer to your question if you think the pre-computer era players were better at obstacle bishop pen games i wouldn't say so for example um i think it was ruben fine who said it a long time ago in the basics of chess endgames what is the book title i don't remember he said pretty much any single endgame where the bishop in the obstacle or bishop endgame the pawns are divided by what was it two lines the stronger side is winning it's not true right i mean it's constantly being reevaluated, and there are some things which i mean people wrongly assumed back then all right uh so anyway this position is easily drawing because white is just standing and doing nothing so black can go around i just go here it doesn't matter i mean it doesn't matter what black is doing i'm just moving here 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 there's nothing happening it's very easy to play and computer doesn't understand it all right now let's switch to one classic Let's start with some more difficult examples. These were, I think, sort of an introduction. Oh, my bad. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's just that come feature. When you paste in the game from the PGN, 
it automatically executes the first move. <laughs> yeah, you, I hope you didn't see that. Anyway, uh, this is the classical game between um, Alexander Kotov, a strong Soviet master. <laughs> I see. A strong Soviet master and... Uh, listen, I want to still get more light here. Can I, can I get it? Wait a second. It's quite dark here. Okay, this is better. <laughs> oh, you didn't see G5. Well, good, good. <laughs> right. So now, I guess now it's good. Now it's good. Maybe I could switch more lights. I mean, I'll test it tomorrow. Because you know what? Tomorrow, I'll have the Blitz stream as well. I mean, on Sunday, I won't have the time to do this because I'll be flying back home from Finland. So tomorrow, I'll be doing the Blitzing stream. I don't know for how long, maybe until I fall asleep, but I'll be doing this. Anyway, so this is a classical game between, uh, what did I say, Alexander Kotov against uh, Mikhail Batvinnik. And um, the, the core idea is, the position is sort of drawish. And I switch on the engine of chess.com. Do you know what it says? It's almost a draw. It just doesn't understand it. So here at quite a low depth, it's, what is it, depth 15 of, uh, what engine does use chess.com? Stockfish? I don't know, really. And the point is, White is thinking about taking here, blocking the bishop on d4 so that there is no discovered check from the bishop. And let's say, let's say, Black would do something like this, king g4. Obviously, we don't want to give up this bishop here. We play bishop e7. King f3, bishop c5, black is doing something, I don't know, I play bishop d4, threatening to take here, here. Okay, I mean, maybe some d4 check, this and this. And computer doesn't understand it, because I just play king b2 and bishop g5 and try to get me out of this position. This is a very easy fortress. Bishop goes on the long diagonal of g5, d8, and that's it. The king never moves from b2. So this is an easy draw. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm sorry I spoiled you away. <laughs> it was supposed to be a surprise. I mean, yeah, it's, it's just that come feature that it sort of executes the move, move right away. So, but when you here play g5, and uh, the idea is obviously that h takes is bad. Because h4, h3, h2 marches forward, these pawns are easily blocked. For example, what was it? Bishop d6, uh, intending to play 5, we block it, we take it, we take it. And this position is easily winning because we are exchanging one of the uh, past pawns for the bishop and we take the pawn on e3 by force. <laughs> Okay, okay, I see that, Paul. Right. So what Kotov played here? G5, F takes. And now the question is, what do you do now? What do you do now? Uh, so the only move here for black to continue, King G4 still gives nothing. Now there is D4 check. We have to preserve the pawn on b3. And it's quite strange, isn't it? Because a moment ago, it was black who was having the extra pawn. Now he gives up two pawns in two moves in a row. And now he is a pawn behind. And yet, he's winning. The reason is this. He creates one protected pass pawn. And here's the second. After e takes, very accurate king g3. Why not king g4? Because there would be d5, bishop f2. And that would be a draw. Here it's impossible. So in the game, Kotov played here. Captures. Here. Captures. Yeah, I mean, I don't think he really could have played um, g6, king g5. It doesn't change much. Uh, because essentially we have two connected, uh, not connected, but two protected past pawns. And what's important, this is the right corner. As you can see, we have the right bishop, because if he would have the other bishop, I could always bring the king here 
and just give up the bishop for this protected pawn. <laughs> I see that Sleepy Mario. Yeah, that went a very, very nice move. A classic, a classical game. Yeah, this is this is a truly a classic. A look at the computer. Computer says here this is a draw. He's wrong. So after d4, um, what did it say? It's still a draw, by the way. Bishop d4. Sh yeah, that's easily winning. King here takes takes uh, whatever. G7. King g3. Yeah, and this this is slowly winning. This is slowly winning. Computer just doesn't understand it. So this was quite a classical, quite a nice idea by Mikhail Botvinnik, the, the patriarch of the so-called Soviet chess. And um, so you'll see that typically it's more important sometimes to create past pawns than, uh, than counting the material. Actually, I had a very funny game myself. I could immediately show it because it directly uh, follows the same pattern of this game. And uh, I intended to show it later, but now I realized I could show it right right away. Uh, so it's uh, my game against um, French Grandmaster Romain Edouard. Uh, we played this game back in, what was it, 2000 and... 16, yeah, wow, four years, four years already, unbelievable. Time flies when having fun. So I was playing black, and doesn't matter what we played here, I went for a very sharp time on off, I was confident I could beat the guy, he surprised me with bishop d2, which was a novelty, I believe, at the time. So I went for a very, very sharp game, I'm not going to annotate this. Uh, it was bad, a bad line. Uh, at some moment, I'm re I realized I'm in trouble, so I need to escape with a draw. So I sacrificed an exchange. So let's not dwell on this too much. And after knight c5, knight f2, here my opponent made a mistake. He played bishop d4, seemingly a very normal move, because he is supposedly trapping the knight. Knight g4, h3, knight h6, g4 looks very tempting. And here... Uh, I realized it's much, much more important to achieve certain positional benefits instead of counting the material. So what I played, I played d6. The knight cannot go away because knight b3 is going to be just knight e4. I gain a very nice outpost on e4. Knight d3 is just a very nice exchange and this is an easy draw. So white had to take here and here. And now let's stop here for a moment. What do you think black has to do here? Nobody is sending me the hydrate command, so I'm going to hydrate myself. Of course. Of course, B3. But why? Do you understand why is that? So the, the reason is obvious, right? So let's say we are doing something. Let's say bishop b7, we can attack the pawn, white defense, and now what? Let's say I'm playing something like king d7, I capture. Let's make some random moves here, here, whatever, here. So white's goal is very simple. He wants to create two protected passed pawns at the queen side. So I, he's going to do it. Doesn't matter what, what we are going to do, it's going to happen. Let's say we are just standing here and doing nothing. And yeah, it's difficult to tell though how I'm going to reach it immediately. Let's say somehow, somehow, I don't know, somehow, whatever. C4 takes here. So this is the ideal position. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the hydrate. I'll take it again. Yeah. So this is the ideal position that White was aiming for. With a very sole purpose. We are going to march forward the queenside pawns and win the bishop. For example, let's say uh, black is doing nothing. We are marching forward. We are marching forward. Black is doing nothing. Uh, we don't want to allow these pawns to be blocked like this. This is a bad idea, right? Remember the principle. We try to position the stronger side, tries to position the pawns on the opposite color of own bishop 
So what here what would actually do? He would try to promote further. Oh, okay, that's checkmate in one. Let's not do this. Here, here, here. And inevitably, inevitably, these pawns push forward. And at some moment, I don't know what moves should I make here. At some moment, uh, let's make some random moves again here. Uh, let's say I'm playing here, b6, here, b7, and this is it. You have to give up the bishop. So black gives up the bishop, and this is easily winning position because we have so many pawns at the queen side, uh, uh, at the king side. Of course, uh, things change. The evaluation changes how many pawns there are, where they're standing. Is the bishop in the right corner, right? This is the right corner. How many pawns there are? I mean, this is easily winning position. So why this was important? Because we recognize the idea. So white wants to create protected to connected pawns. So this is why we give up the pawn, we double it. And the whole point is first fix the pawns at the king side. And after c4, what do we do? Does anybody know? We don't do nothing. So that's the point. We do nothing. We just allow it to take. And that's that's the biggest the biggest point here. I mean, we don't play checkers. I mean, bishop a6 doesn't matter. Yeah, let white take exactly. We're just sitting here. So this is the core defense idea. If we take on c4, we are busted right away. We cannot take it. So again, these positional gains are more important than the actual material situation on the board. And this is quite paradoxical for certain endgames, especially for this one. So here the game progressed. He was still trying to win this. Yeah, still trying to grind this out. I was not allowing to... Um, uh, I mean, to, I, I was not going to take on c4. I just have to watch out for this pawn. And what was trying to get there. Do you see some similarity with the previous endgame? It is similar, right? c takes, he finally took it. I don't care about the pawn on b3. I just try to make some moves. And my bishop can defend these two both weaknesses on e6 and h5. It doesn't matter what that white has three protected pawns. So what happened here? I just go away from the king because I know that the bishop is going to handle it. And here the key moment is I have to watch out for one idea, for one little idea. H3 is quite smart. So white is inviting me to play bishop g2. It feels very, very tempting. Yeah, it's very tempting because supposedly h4, bishop f3, that's it. This is the draw, right? And king h5, bishop takes. is also a draw. I can even drop this pawn. I just position the bishop on g4 and that's it. That's a fortress. But the pro problem here is that after bishop g2, I'm sorry, what was it? Uh, yeah, after bishop g2, what plays g4? h takes obviously is bad, h4. But also f takes is bad, h4. And do you see some parallels to cutoffs and Batwinning's game? It was exactly the same idea. Yeah, the same idea. And we lose the pawn. These pawns don't matter. This pawn on e6 on g4, it doesn't matter at all. Like I said, the positional gains are more important than the material gain. So this is quite important to recognize this idea. I mean, I don't remember in the game, did I remember the, the game against uh, Kotov and Batvinik? I just recognized the idea. Yeah, maybe in the subconscious somewhere. I mean, definitely. I, I wasn't thinking about the game uh, during the game. I just recognized the idea. So I was doing nothing. I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. These pawns don't matter. I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. And critical moment arises here. A white could have played g4 f takes and h4 now do you recognize the idea what white wants to do here i'll take another hydrate i'll let you figure it out
Not exactly the best lighting here, but it will do. Uh, why can I take the e-pawn? Because I'm gonna play bishop b3. White wants to go for the h-pawn. So the idea is, if white is gonna run here, we are gonna have to play g3. So white's idea is to play first bishop g3. So this is the big idea. And now the king inevitably goes here and this is lost. This is a lost position. Um, did white have to go to c5 for that? No, I, I don't think he had to do it. I just wanted to show the idea. So the point is, if white would take here, uh, whatever, doesn't matter. Here, g4, f takes h4, we play g3. And now again, the bishop defends these both weaknesses. And the pawns on b6, b4, b2, they don't matter at all. Uh, why the bishop can't hold with bishop e8? I think he's gonna be in a zook trunk. Let's say, let's say, takes here. I'm losing a, a tempo. Bishop g3 here. Uh, let's let's try this. Okay, maybe instead of this, no, this has to be. I think has to be played. King d6 here. King e5. I have to protect this pawn here here. And how do you bring the bishop to e8? It's impossible. The pawn on e6 is under attack. And I can try to take this pawn. I can try to take this pawn as well. But I'm going to lose everything at the, at the king side. So that is the idea. So the king, the white king, inevitably gets to g6. And we won't have the time to play bishop e8. So that's why it was so crucial immediately to play g3. And unluckily for white... Yeah, and luckily for White, he cannot do the same stuff at the same time. He cannot go g4, f takes h4, and bishop g3 in one move. He has to make one move at a time. So, I mean, I saw this stuff, obviously. So, this was in the game. He tried to trick me somehow, and finally he played h4. Last chance. Last chance. Very tricky chance. So, let's say I'm making a mistake here, and I'm losing g4 f takes and bishop g3 the same idea i didn't fell for it and i played bishop d1 draw greed black is down four pawns almost a rook and yet white is powerless computer says plus 2.5 it just doesn't understand you can insert as many pawns as you want on the b file i i can give you extra here on g2 doesn't change anything so so that's quite an important a defensive setup from black's perspective which was i mean typically the game between kotov and uh, botvinnik is the most uh, popular example but i think also my game wasn't so bad really hi frappuccino all right now let's move on to the next stuff. Uh, let me show you a very important technique in the opposite color bishop endgame. I was actually inspired. Yeah, I was actually quite inspired by uh, Yermolinsky's video. Uh, Alexander Yer Yermolinsky is a um, well known GM. Quite a famous grandmaster, uh, originally from Russia, now living in the United States, as far as I know. And he has made some very nice videos at chess.com. And I saw a long, long time ago, he made a very nice video about obstacle bishops. And I sort of borrowed this, this idea from him and added some my own stuff. Uh, so, But the idea is I wouldn't really want to specify who was the first one yeah i think he is still uncle yermo <laughs> as people call him right yeah and uh, i think it was yuri averbach who first said it in 1972 another russian soviet grandmaster uh that if there are two bishop pawns here in this game let's let us switch okay here black played rook for king e4 so the rule is this 
if we have two bishop pawns uh, and the defensive side can put them on the same diagonal this is a draw it's actually a very easy draw so let's check the game so uh, the game was played between two very high level of Russian grandmasters back in 2015 by Ernesto Inner Kiev uh, against Anton Demchenko uh, Demchenko was on the rise at the time I think he right now is about 2670 well within world top 100 uh, at the time he was shortly below 2600 and rising so he was playing with the black and trying to beat in Kiev. so in the game actually I think rook f4 was a mistake I mean of course the position bears a character of a draw shang game it is a draw shang game and if black had known this okay if black had known this he would never trade it because this is a theoretical draw apparently he didn't know it so what happened in the game let me check uh, let me show you takes here king g6 so the idea is this this is the long diagonal and we have to keep both pawns on this diagonal at all costs this pawn doesn't matter it's, it's paradoxical right it's the most advanced pawn it doesn't matter it can move as far as to f3 as long as it stays on the same diagonal what matters is the pawn on c6 and this is quite paradoxical because it makes no sense now look at what happened in the game so uh inner key played correctly king e5 not allowing the king go on f6 here here yeah and here supposedly white is in a tzuk's one because he has a choice either to keep this pawn from marching forward i'm sorry too many arrows here or this pawn from marching forward and he decided that this pawn is the most advanced pawn and he's gonna keep it and king f4 actually loses the game by force let's check how it does it so king f6 here doesn't matter and that this is it uh the long diagonal has been broken so the bishop can no longer i'm sorry this is wrong diagonal obviously so the bishop can no longer hold the pawns on the same diagonal i'm gonna get to why he cannot do the same here because it also seemingly is the same diagonal right let's let's go to that they were playing quite many moves here here and there here and there this is winning this is absolutely winning the pawn inevitably goes forward inevitably white is set in a tsuk the pawns are marching forward very slowly very carefully uh black is i mean white is completely uh powerless to stop him and in the end we reach this position yeah so we reach this position uh the king inevitably gets to d3 e2 and pushes the pawn forward and this pawn on c2 is protected by pawn on uh by the bishop on a4 for example like here um okay let's say white would do something like this here okay then it's f2 yeah he cannot do this uh yeah th so this is a tsukswang actually and king c4 bishop goes away king d3 bishop a4 king e2 this is a win now let's try to put the pawns on the same diagonal but from c1 to h6 and see what happens let's say white would still try to keep everything on the same diagonal and uh for that to happen he doesn't he cannot allow supposedly the bishop i mean the pawn to cross uh, okay let's let's say it here okay let's let's try it here 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 f2 here here bishop goes uh let's say here 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 yeah here the line again uh, is broken but ah wait a second i wanted to position bishop on c1 okay let me try to do this here and bishop on c1 
king b3. So this is the idea I wanted to show you. Here, 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 and it's impossible. It's impossible to hold it because you don't have access. Do you see it? d0. There is no d0. So that would be king e1 and here, here. You need a square. You cannot have it. The board ends. So this is why this long diagonal doesn't hold. And I'm going to show you the right technique, how to hold this. So after bishop e3 here, this is a losing move. So what white should have done is keep this pawn from advancing forward c6, c5. Um, Dutch national training way of explaining it. What's that? Double function of the bishop. <laughs> if you say so. Uh, so I'm going to show you this idea. Let's say um, bishop d3. And we are allowing the king to march forward. And this is paradoxical. Right? King g5. Let him go. Let him go. Doesn't matter. King g4 or f4. Doesn't matter. We are going to go even back. It doesn't matter. Okay. The bishop is under attack. Here. King, I could even allow it to go forward. Ah, oh, okay, maybe not here. Maybe not here. Let's say here, f4, here. Wait a second. Did I play it correctly? I think I slightly misplayed this. Again, I don't want to allow this hold of the long diagonal to break. So the principle is this. We want to keep the pawn advancing from c6 to c5 so let's be accurate let's say here 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 f4 and king d2 right so again if the king runs here towards the c5 pawn we can wait it runs here, and we are keeping it. F3, bishop b6. And this is a paradoxical position. Black cannot win this. Again, he cannot push forward. We are going to stay bishop a7, bishop b6. He's going to run here. Where goes the king? There goes the white king. Black is waiting. White is waiting. Black is going forward to push. We are following. Black is waiting, a white is waiting. He goes back, we follow. He waits, we wait. He goes for the d5 square to push, and we follow. So this is quite a crucial uh, idea of the same game. And if you don't know it, yeah, this is insane. And again, look at this position. Can you recognize this idea from afar, right here? Uh, would you recognize this here that you are not allowed to play king f4 if you don't know this principle i mean this is mainly for the bishop pawns the more um the more uh, uh how to say divided they are there's going to be a bishop pawn and a knight pawn we're going to talk about it in the next example there's going to be a different rule but for the bishop pawns, the rule applies that you have as a defense, defensive side keep both protected pawns on the same diagonal. So again, this is the critical, this is the critical diagonal, right? Let him come forward. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. There's nothing. F. Let's say bishop goes here, um, here f4 looks looks super dangerous except it's it's not f3 here uh did i misplay it bishop e2 yeah i misplayed yeah i managed to misplay it. okay okay as you can see even i can manage to misplay it right but since I, i'm just very very quickly showing you this idea you just have to remember the principle and just watch out watch out uh, for example, uh, bishop b5, I would probably play king d4 here, 
Can I play King C3? Yeah, I'm gonna be in time. Yeah, very, very accurate. And this is paradoxical. We are moving away from the pawn. I mean, this is strange, but we are heading for this E1 square. So let's say black is waiting. And again, let's be very accurate here. Or maybe, maybe instead of this, King G3 or King F3 for that matter. Here, again, let's be accurate here. We don't allow King G2 F3. We are watching out for King D4, King D5. So again, we wait. King E1 would be a terrible move. Okay, let's say black is giving us a move. This is a terrible move. Here we are lost. That's it. We're lost. So King D5, C5, resign. That's it. Uh, Bishop G1. Uh, you mean where? Where do you mean Bishop G1? You mean here? I don't know. Uh, this was some, some exception. I wasn't sure about this. Here. King g3, uh, probably not. Our king is in the way. It has to be on e1, not in front of the bishop. That's the problem. So, for example, this is lost already. Yeah, computer very quickly recognized I'm too far away from the e1 square. Stream lag? Uh, there shouldn't be any stream lag. All right. All right. So I hope you at least understand the principle. And now we are going to watch a very famous game. I'm going to put it on. And I'll start it from here. I'm keeping quiet. I think everybody knows this one, right? But do you understand the idea? So obviously this is this is the game. Oh, it's dark here. This is the game between Veselin Topalov and Ale Alexey Shirov. So you recognize the move. Why he played? Uh, he has to be close. Yeah, but again, the principle remains the same. The king... Oh, <laughs> I have a help, but now it's worse. You get it? Now it's worse. I have a help here, but he just made my situation much worse. <laughs> I just have to relocate myself. Listen, uh, can you uh, put it in front here? I have a teammate here. He is helping me. He's my assistant. <laughs> He's a very strong GM himself. He's keeping quiet, not not uh, some somehow. Oh, this is great! Oh, look at this! Fantastic! It's like pro level. <laughs> okay, that was Nikita Meshkov, a very strong grandmaster, my teammate here in the Finnish league. Yeah, this is much better actually. Anyway, yeah, hi Arpi Kordi. Uh, yeah, so the game is obviously uh, Veslin Topov against Alexei Shirov, and Shirov here played boom Bishop H3, and everybody was in Eve. Oh my goodness, what is that? But if we are looking at a position without emotions, do you understand the motive of this move? It wasn't really like Shiro was thinking, okay, I have to give up the bishop for nothing. Let's make the most spectacular move in the chess history. So, oh, oh, there's bishop h3. It doesn't work like that. So his idea was the white bishop is keeping these two pawns on the same diagonal. So a3, a2 gives nothing because he keeping the pawns on the same diagonal. Let's say he would be playing something like very normal. Um, okay, bishop e4. Bishop e4, g3, king f5, here. And then what? Let's say bishop goes away. I try to free the square. I try to break this one diagonal for the bishop. I play king e3. I push forward, I wait. I push forward, wait. And what does black do here? King g4, here. g5, takes. King g5, I wait. Here, I play here. I could go around. I could go around. 
would go around here here where are you gonna go here okay there's the pawn dropping but anyway the king is never gonna get around so that is that is the main idea so this is why Shirov decided to give up this bishop on h3 so that he can land on e4 just to win a tempo and again the fin uh not the financial but the material situation on the board uh yeah but it's not like he's risking anything <laughs> so the the whole point is landing with the king on e4 so this is how the game progressed here here that's another protected pawn it has to be taken away d4 so the pawn is marching forward so he has to play here this is all forced here so black wants to play here with the king and push forward the pawn he has to, white has to play bishop c5 now king c4 a critical tempo again white has to keep the bishop here king b3 and white resigned because king c2 d3 a3 d2 is inevitable hi check up I, no you're not late i was late i was late i apologize about that i had to carry uh, a washing machine <laughs> our boss in the finish league he asked me to carry a washing machine and <laughs> there was a detour for something like half an hour maybe he's watching the stream now feeling guilty <laughs> okay but um don't worry about it too much yeah i see there is some i see there is some little lag i apologize about it if you have it yeah i'm, I'm relying on on hotels wi-fi it's supposedly very good but of course it's not as reliable as from home i'm streaming from finland i i flew to finland this morning first time in six months <laughs> Yeah, washing machine. I mean, it wasn't only me. It was also Nikita, who was here in the background. He helped me to set up my lights. Here's actually some very good lights. Yeah, actually, look at that. <laughs> I could use them. Yeah, listen. So, so this is how the game ended. And so that's how this spectacular idea of Bishop H3 was born. And the whole point is, if White tries to keep... The, the black king from entering e4 black still takes it here takes and king e4 so and this is it bishop f6 d4 is the same idea with the only difference that the pawn is standing on h3 the king is flexible to protect others i i did not answer your question subtafsha Uh, so I think the core idea of this example, I mean, this is the famous game between Vesel and Topalf and Alexei Shirov. The core idea is both sides recognize the idea to keep both protected pawns on the same diagonal. And already what I mentioned in the previous example was Yuri Aberbach. I think he was the first one who said it back in 1972 is that the, uh, the defensive side has to keep both protected pawns on the same diagonal. In the previous example, I was showing the bishop pawns, I mean the c pawn and the f pawn. Here you can see the same principle applies. All right. While we are looking at this great stuff, let's move forward. I'm going to show you uh, an exception. And uh, this game... Yeah, it started earlier. Uh, this is a game between uh, Vasilios Kotronius, uh, one of the leading grandmaster of uh, Cyprus, I think. And then he, I don't know, Cyprus or Greece. I think Cyprus and Greece are essentially the same. <laughs> I mean, very, very close countries. And uh, he was playing against uh, F. Stratios Grivas uh, back in 1992. What had completely winning position. So we are not going to analyze it too much. Kotronius with white, uh, Grivas with black. And at some moment, white misplayed. Yeah, he misplayed the position. He had simply easily winning position. And he missed this shot. Bishop c5. So either king takes or b pawn, uh, or b takes. Oh, wait a second. I'm not showing you this. Sorry, wrong board. 
<laughs> I was moving in the wrong board. Yeah. So White was completely messing it up, and he missed the shot. Bishop c5. Either b takes or king c5 is going to be met by a check either here or here, and the g pawn advances. So White gave a check, took on g2, which is actually a mistake. Oh wait a second, was it like this? Yeah, here was actually White still winning after king c5. Check. Was it winning though? Here, here. Let me check it. I didn't really check it though. Takes, takes, b5. Computer says it's winning. But anyway, White didn't recognize the rising position. He played here, here, and took with the rook. And this is a theoretical draw. And it's interesting. He did not recognize it. So, so what's going to happen here? Now, let, let's look at this position. White has two protected, I mean not protected, they are two uh, advanced pawns. And the bishop cannot hold them on the same diagonal, right? This is not it. It's not holding. And he cannot hold it neither on this diagonal because the pawn has marched uh, the center. So seemingly he is lost. But there is a major exception. This pawn is on the B file. And because of this pawn, this is a draw. So let, let me show you how, how to make a draw here. These moves are seemingly forced. So White is trying to push forward. Here, here. And here, and the critical moment. Black is seemingly in a tsuk So it doesn't matter what he does. One of the pawns marches forward. And if you don't know it, it's very difficult to understand which one to stop and where to position your king. Now, I'm going to offer you a choice it's either king b8 or king d8 because the bishop cannot go i mean the bishop has to guard the pawn uh, the pawn watching to e7 otherwise e7 e8 that's automatic queen so it's either here or here what do you think King d8, king b8, king d8, <laughs> king d8. Is there a sign to one of these moves? This is a big mistake. It looks the same. And imagine yourself, you've played four hours, five hours, a long game. This is a tournament. There is a tense situation. The last round, you are tired. And you have to make decision for something like in 30 seconds. Because that's the I mean, okay, 1992 when they played the game. I don't think, I don't think they had it. Yeah. So the correct move is King D8. You are marching away from the pawn, but why is that? I mean, it's not really obvious. Yeah, King B8 is the obvious choice, right, Paul? It's the obvious choice. We're blocking the pawn, but yet it's losing by force. So why is that? Because after King B8, which happened in the game? B6, black is doing something, king goes around, and that's it. King goes here, bishop goes here, the king goes here, and resignation. We are marching forward the e pawn, and this is not a fortress. So the paradoxical situation here was that Black had to play king d8. White still plays b6. And now it's this is insane. If you don't know this, it's it's very difficult to pick this up. But imagine yourself. I mean, it is possible to pick this up if you understand the idea. Imagine yourself what white wants to do. So it's two moves. It's b7 followed by king a7 
So again, let's say we are seemingly um, doing nothing like here. Yeah. Okay. Then b7 loses on the spot because king, e, king c7, e7, we are losing this pawn on his race towards the queen. After b6, white is threatening to play b7. So the only move is to play bishop d6. Another paradoxical move. We are moving away from the pawn. But what we are reaching is this position. Bishop b8. And that's it. White has no squares for penetration. King b6, king e7, king c6. We are just standing and doing nothing. Doing nothing, doing nothing. Maybe at the right time I can also do the same with the bishop. Maybe I can go with here. As long as I don't allow for the white king to go to a7. That's it. It's very, very actually simple if you know the idea. But if you don't, it can be difficult, right? So, quite paradoxical. One move, king d8. We go, off, go away from the pawn, b6 and bishop d6. Okay, so white is not going to go b7 right away. He plays king a7. We recognize the idea. Yeah, of course it is logical. I mean, you can think of this, even if you don't know it. But I think it really helps if you know the evaluation of the position. It really helps. So white is threatening to play b7. We go back. White is doing something. We are also waiting. White is waiting. We are waiting. So the king stays here. King a6. Again, bishop g3. With the same idea here. White waits. We wait. We don't go bishop b8. Bishop b8 is losing. King b7, king a8, b7, b8. Don't go right away bishop b8. We wait. And white is waiting. We are waiting. White is going around. Now, this is quite a critical moment. Here, here, and still we're doing nothing. I mean, there's more than one move which is holding the position. Again, the core idea is it b7, bishop b8. And if white is trying to go around, at some moment we can already force this pawn to go to b7. We go here, here, king e7, and that's a draw. Uh, <laughs> after king b7, you attack the pawn? Yeah, probably. Yeah, maybe I didn't mention this. You mean here, right? After king b7? Yeah, I mean, bishop f to make sense. A white is going here. We are, let's say, I can even wait it here. Doesn't matter. As long as you don't allow b7 and king a7 or king a8. So that's it. So that's it. And there's no way. There's no way. So this position with um, uh, with a connected pawn. I'm uh, not connected. Um, with protected. Again, not protected. With past pawns. White has two extra pawns. And they are divided by two lines. So one line is here and this is here and despite the fact we are not holding them on the same diagonal which i showed you in the previous example this is still a draw because white has the knight pawn and we can always block it and what's the difference let's say if we would have the bishop's pawn the king could go here it could go around i hope you understand the difference so what is the difference between a knight's pawn and the bishop pawn? The white king could go around here. It cannot do it. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I keep me keep. Uh, <laughs> it's been a long day. I mean, I keep. Uh, I will. I just carry the washing machine for God's sake. <laughs> I, I yeah, my my tongue is not really the best shape <laughs> okay but there yeah yeah there is no column no extra line on the left at, at the queen side right okay let's move forward let's move forward i wanted to show you this amazing game between uh ivan cheparinov 
the leading uh, Bulgarian grandmaster. Now I believe he plays for Georgia. I don't know why. And uh, yeah, it can. How can it go outside in 5D chess? I, I don't know. Can it? Never tried it really. <laughs> right. Okay. So this game was played. Um, Ivan Ceparinov was playing with black against Yeres Perez Alfonso. Uh, I don't know, the white player. Uh, presumably, he's about international master. And Ceparino was playing with black. He has nothing extra. It's about equal. But he has a protected... Uh, again, I said protected, right? Yeah, he has a passed pawn at the queen side. And a very nice blockade here. But if he would remove these H pawns, this would be an easy draw because white still easily protects the A pawn from mo moving forward and just keeps his king side intact. But because of this pawn on H3, this gives black actually some chances. Let's see what happened in the game. Uh, let's look, look it from the black's perspective. Uh, yeah, so Ciparino was slowly improving the position, bringing the king on e5. The king inevitably gets to f4, so he eyes for this pawn. So there's nothing white can do. The pawn is lost, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The h5, the only chance. Uh, there's no reason for black king to get to b4 because he's not going to get far. He needs some extra weaknesses here at the center. And at the king side. So this is what he played. He tried to create a weakness and he did. He did create a weakness. And quite inevitably, white lost the second pawn. Here, white correctly recognized he has to trade the G pawn as quickly as possible, otherwise, he's gonna lose this game. So he played G5 here, here, here g6 the correct defense f5 obviously black doesn't want to trade the pawns and what happened here we got this position now let me again switch it from the white's perspective these moves were forced here and here now if i would ask you if i would ask you what would be your defensive setup for white seemingly this is an easy draw because these pawns are not even separated by two lines it's just one it's just one uh, but that would be the case if the pawns would be separated by two lines here it's just one but please answer uh first of the question which piece is gonna guard which pawn so the bishop is gonna guard the f pawn and the king is the d pawn or the bishop is gonna guard the d pawn and the king the most furthest f pawn can you tell it right away what is the difference so i hope you understand what i'm asking so the this bishop is gonna take care of this pawn and the king is going to take of this pawn or the opposite this bishop is going to blocking this pawn and the king is going to be blocking the f pawn yeah it is paradoxical <laughs> it is paradoxical but i'll explain you what uh what's the difference of course so let's see what happened in the game first let's see here This is all of this is was forced up to one moment. Zugzwang. Zugzwang. Zugzwang means white has no move. He would love to stand, do nothing. He cannot. He is losing by force. So bishop f1 is met by d3, and this is easily winning position. Now, what's the difference? let's go back let's go back to the starting position here so we chose the wrong defense 
the bishop cannot block this pawn. So where's the difference again? Let's try it here. We are going to bring the king towards the f pawn. Seemingly is the same, right? Do you see the difference? Can somebody explain it to me? Yeah, <laughs> king obviously keeps that pawn, but what is the difference? Yeah, that is the difference. Obviously, yeah, busted. No Tsukzwang. There is more space for the bishop, so we can play bishop a4, bishop b3, bishop a4, bishop b3 to how long, wherever we want. This is way too short, Diana. And seemingly, it might seem, what is the difference? Why should I bother? Why should I bother? Because what, what white played with was completely logical, right? Very, very logical defense. And yet it loses because the bishop is on the short diagonal. And the right choice was here quite paradoxical. To recognize that the king has to go here. And this bishop is going to take care of this pawn. And this is how we draw the game. All right. Let me move forward. Um... Quite an important uh, motive of these endgames, of these obstacle of bishop endgames, is uh, the so-called blocking of the opponent's king, not allowing it to penetrate. Uh, this game, I don't know, I just found it somewhere. There was some Miller playing against Saidi, American Open 1971, and here White resigned. White resigned because uh, Ruben Fine had said in the book, in the first edition of Basic Chess Endings, if the pawns are two or more files apart, they win. So White thought, they are two or more files apart, this is it, I resign. But the only difference here is that Ruben Fine was wrong. It's still a draw. Because the black king cannot penetrate the backside of white's position. Doesn't matter what he tries, we are blocking him. We are just not letting him in. So here it's not the same diagonal. It's another principle. We are not allowing for the black king to penetrate. Here, here. Here, here. We are not allowing it to get to e3. Here we can wait. If he tries to go around, he is not gonna get anywhere. Here and wait a second. Did I misplay it? Did I just misplay this position? Yeah, maybe I did. <laughs> maybe I did, but at least theoretically the, the idea remains the same. I just wanted to show you this idea. Um, with a G pawn, you can block. You can block the key. Yeah, that that is the motive. Yes, yeah, sometimes with the G pawn or the so-called knight's pawn, you can block the king. You can not allow it to penetrate your ranks, and this is quite paradoxical because the difference between the pawns is three lines should be winning, right? It's not. Again, these knight pawns are very very tricky positions. All right, let me move forward. Now, this is going to be a very nice example. Very, very nice. Supposedly, it comes uh, from a symbol of John Nunn, a well-known English grammaster, uh, who played it in a symbol. I don't know if he was the inventor of the idea. I don't know. But it, it is one of the very first examples. Seemingly, this is a draw. Because it looks like a fortress. Let me, let me perhaps... Uh, let's move this pawn from f4 to h4. Like this. 
Now this is a draw because the bishop on e1 is going to uh, guard the pawn on g5. The king is never going to leave the c7 square, so you can do whatever you want with white. I'm not going to move with the king. But the pawn stands here. And that makes a big, big difference. So here, 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 here. And the key move here is g3. So the idea is revealed after f takes bishop g2. We imprison the bishop. So seemingly, what's the idea, right? I mean, I'm, I'm doing nothing. Yeah, let's say I'm doing nothing. I'm waiting here, here, waiting nothing. Um, how maybe I should play it like this here, here. It's very, very accurate play here, here, and now black is in the took swung because here, here, we cannot allow the white king to get to d7, maybe king c six okay then then this accelerates this need to push g4 at some moment black is gonna have to push g4 and we just easily win this king goes here we march forward uh these pawns and again we try to avoid some uh blockade of the black king but we already have crashed through and eventually we should exchange the g pawn for the bishop and because of this protected pawn we are winning the game Ah, <laughs> you had it. Okay. But this is quite a nice motif. It's quite important to know. So we can try at least uh, follow one of the very first examples I was showing from Alexander Alekhin's game. So let's say you might ask, what's the difference? Because let's say I play g3, I take with the bishop, king g5. And now seemingly we have to do just one thing. <laughs> yeah. Just one thing. Look at this. This is the wrong corner. Do you see this, guys? Wrong corner. So I imagine I want to quickly get the king to h8. I want with the bishop to land on a5 and claim a draw. It's impossible because we are out of time. So bishop e1, bishop a5. King goes here. This demands way too much time. The king never gets there. We are just out of time. And the bishop goes back. Even if uh, black queens first, white is delivering a checkmate. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work. Let me show you another example from this idea. It was quite a famous game uh, between Wang Yu and Ning Luren. Ning Luren now obviously is well known as one of the best players in the world. In this game, he was from, from the defensive side. Wang Yu was as white player. And do you see the pawn structure? Do you see the pawn structure at the queen side? I'm pretty sure. Wang Yu here as white already had recognized the arising endgame. So he was playing for the checkmate. I mean, he has at the moment extra pawn. Doesn't matter. This extra pawn doesn't matter. What matters is the positional game. So he safely took on a four, proposed the queen trade. Ding Luren was trying to avoid it. So white was aiming for a checkmate. He didn't even bother capturing the pawns of b6, although it might have been winning. He plays for the checkmate. Here, here, here. And finally, he forced the queen trade. Because he knows this is a winning position. Captures. Here, here, here. All of this is forced. The white king goes for the pawn on b6. And now we already know the idea. b4. c takes. 
and Bishop B3. And that's it. The bishop is imprisoned. Yeah, exactly the same idea. So the king goes back here, and we just go and deal with the black king. So if black plays b5, we are just going to take it, go back here, and just advance this pawn toward the queen. Again, if you don't know the idea, from afar, I can tell you it looks the same. For example, let's look at the starting position here. If we move this pawn from c5 to a5, that is easy draw because we are blocking these pawns on h5 g4 at the dark squares this pawn on e5 is absolutely irrelevant it doesn't matter it could be also not standing there but what is relevant is this placement of the pawns yes some some question maybe i rushed with something sure you can uh, ask something if something is not clear Uh, trying to memorize yeah so this uh, b6 c5 is not a very safe fortress it's not so you have to try something else so this did not happen i mean it did happen i mean uh, yeah and one more final example about exact the same motive i'm gonna show you a very old game yefim bogolubov a German chess legend. I think he was German. Yeah. He was playing against Max Blumich in 1925, uh, some German chess congress. Yeah. I don't know. The tournament. And yeah, again, <laughs> again, just the come rush forward and uh, made me to play Rook D5, uh, Rook D1 first. So here, white goes. For the opposite color bishop, everything is equal. Can you imagine? This position is lost for black. There is no chance. It's quite insane. I mean, it's opposite color bishop should be easy draw. No, this one is not a draw. Let's look how the game proceeded. So white is going forward and tries to take these pawns. One of them dropped, then he took another, then he creates some protected pass pawns, took protected pass pawns, and black just resigned. But wait a second. I was thinking about, is it really lost? And I was trying to prove that black can hold this. So after king d4, I tried to make work here, here, and here. So my idea was... I'll try to call with the bishop the king side. I would never accept a draw with white because, I mean, it's only white who is playing for the win. And if white wants a draw, he would always make it. It is black who is suffering, who has quite a weak position. And it's not, not really an equal position. It doesn't matter what the opposite color bishops are there or not. Yeah, look at the position. So... The king goes there, forward, so you have to do something. You have to try to trade here. So the idea, white wants to play g3, go forward, try to take these pawns. Something is going to fall. So I came up with this idea to play g3 here and here. Looks like a quite a valid idea. Yeah, thank you for the, for the hydrate. Now let's see what would happen here. Um, from the original position. Ah, from the original position. Okay, I see. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah, the same position. The same position. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, of course, it would be here, 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 here. Yeah, the same idea. Everything is the same. So we played g4, f takes, and g3. That's it. <laughs> so what again? Uh, yeah, it's the same idea. Again, we imprison the bishop. Do you see the position, this pattern? These pawns against these pawns. 
and the bishop on h5. It, it is exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, and this is quite quite a nice idea. Quite a nice idea to know. So I did not manage to find a draw for black in this position. And again, the king goes here, tries to create a passed pawn. We make it. At some moment, black pushes g5. We just take the h pawn and just go back and queen it. That's it. This pawn on e4 is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Okay. Let's go forward. And uh, I'll show you some final examples. For example, this one. This is my game against, um, yeah, again, thank you, chess.com. <laughs> yeah, so that's why I'm teaching something here, so that you will know it after today. <laughs> nah, I don't think it's so bad. I was playing this game with black. Uh, myself against uh, one of the leading German um, grandmasters, uh, Daniel Friedman, who originally comes from Riga, super nice guy, super friendly. And uh, he he just played rook d1, rook a1, I apologize. We're playing this in a rapid game. So I recognize the idea. Obviously, he wants to penetrate my ranks here. He wants to play king d1 the next move. And he's going to try to cause quite a lot of trouble for me at the, at the queen side. So I recognize my only chance is to try to give up a pawn. Takes, takes, takes. And try to position my pawns on the color of my opponent's, uh, of my of my bishop's uh, color. So naturally, white doesn't want me at all to play four. Let's say here a four. Let's imagine takes takes takes. This is a draw because I'm going to position the king here, the bishop here. And how are you going to crash through? Remember my gain against uh, uh, Romain Edouard. He had these triple B pawns. They give nothing. They just cannot march forward. Obviously, it's more complicated than that. Because uh, white can create another protected passport. It's not clear what's happening here. I'll tell you honestly. It's not really so easy to validate. Because this margin from a drawn position to a winning position it's very narrow very narrow and even the top gms i would you would ask somebody is this position winning yeah probably but like 100 percent of the no 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 not 100 percent. maybe there is a room for mistake so this is not really a standard position and the second thing is white could just ignore so also this position is not really clear if this position is a draw or not if he would remove these pawns, yeah, sure, it's draw. I position the king here again. The bishop goes on this diagonal, protecting this pawn on g7, and that's it. But with the pawns on e5, I'm not sure. <coughs> anyway, so why decided not to find it out? He played a 4, fixed this pawn on f5, takes, takes, here, here. And quite inevitably, white goes forward to the c-pawns. So the whole difference is that white wants to sacrifice the bishop in f5 and penetrate. So we are trying to build sort of a fortress, not allow for the white king to crash through. But unfortunately, white will have this amazing shot in bishop f5. So you might ask, wait a second. If bishop f5 is such a big threat, why don't you play g6? It's a very valid question. For example, g6, let's say h3, h5, h4. I had an identical game exactly like this uh, some, some time ago, maybe some couple of years ago. So the idea is quite simple. White wins this. Let's look at this. I mean, bishop f2, bishop g3 is impossible. These pawns just march forward. So this pawn is, they are taboo, they cannot be taken. So the idea is here that inevitably white plays, okay, who is it to move here? 
White inevitably plays check. Bishop here. You cannot go it here because I'm going to sacrifice it. I move, move, uh, move forward. This would sort of resemble with Shirov's idea against Topolov. We sacrifice the bishop to gain time. We sacrifice the bishop to penetrate uh, Black's ranks. So let's say Black is not doing this. He's still trying to block me. Here. And he's trying to block me. He's trying to block me. And I can even make a spectacular bishop f7. Yeah, maybe not really as spectacular as Shirov's uh, bishop h3, but the idea is the same, right? We are fighting for the square on d6. King f7, king d6, c7. This is even more simpler than in Shirov's game. Uh, yeah, I fixed the pawns. Yeah, sack the bishop game a move, because again, the positional gains are more important than the actual count of the pawns. Yeah, again, but... What do you do against this bishop f5? It's not really clear, right? Bishop f5, king d5, king d6. It's a very simple idea. So g6 is a natural choice. After g6, okay, maybe h5 wasn't necessary, but it doesn't change the whole idea. To capture these pawns, sacrifice the bishop and penetrate through d5 and d6, and that's it. So what I did, I was playing with black. What I did, I played um, king d6, st still trying to build a fortress, here, here, and suddenly my opponent faltered. That was really strange. He played king b4, captures, here, here, and here. Uh, sorry, king c7. Yeah, apparently he just blundered or hallucinated that he can play b6 but i just take the pawn um bishop e4 is just too slow i position the bishop here i am waiting i'm waiting and waiting and as soon as the king goes back i'm blocking the pawn here and this is how the game progressed there is no no idea so he tried to make it work it was an easy draw so, where was the win? Where's the win? It was a winning position. Let me go back. So, the winning position was here. He had to play h3. Lure the bishop here. Then play... Uh, what was it? Bishop here. I want to play b6. And c7. King c7 has to be played. And very accurate. King c5. b6 cannot be allowed. King b4. I still need to take this pawn. And king e5. And black is in no time to capture the pawn. So it might seem the same, but the difference is white is inevitably creating another pass pawn at the king side. And by this, he is just effectively winning the game. Right. All right. Um, let me show you one, one more example. Here. What do you think? Knight takes on c5. Is it any good? Or should we look for something else? <laughs> Jacob is thinking. That's good. So what what happens after knight c five? Knight c five. Obviously, black is gonna take here. Now, can we go for this position or not? Yeah, the topic obviously is the opposite color bishops, right? But the question is, can we do this or not? Can we do this or not? Because again, the narrow margin 
of a drawing position and a winning position sometimes is like I said very narrow yeah why exchange yeah that's a very valid point of course Paul why allow to trade you wouldn't do this what would you do what would you do here it's not a top choice of the engine by the way if you ask what is the top choice of the engine the engine says king d2 king e2 king e2 <laughs> that is the top choice of the engine so don't really listen Yeah, it is winning. It is winning. So the idea is, while it's very scary, we already have one protected pass pawn. We are going to position the bishop here. And inevitably, there's going to be a second protected pass pawn. And in addition, we have these pawns on the board. So this should be an easy win because it doesn't matter which pawns we are going to create. It's one, two, three four pawns i mean four lines between but our protected uh past pawns and the this pawn the h pawn is the right corner of our bishop is there a merit to start with day four no, i think knight c5 just wins easily there's no point to start with day four so the critical moment is that bishop b1 doesn't give anything because we imprisoned bishop so this is impossible it doesn't change anything inevitably the bishop goes here there's nothing black can do okay maybe not like this here 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 yeah and that's it inevitably inevitably we are gonna get get this pawn this pawn matches to h6 and black is going to be unable to hold two past pawns one of the king side one of the queen side yeah and then i found some um uh, uh some thoughts there's a grandmaster jesus de la villa i i don't know him and he i found somewhere in the internet he said supposedly his rules about how many files separate the pawns in the obstacle or bishop end games and he tried to define the rules and he says it's like this if the pawns are separated by two files two bishop pawns normally win but i'll immediately add if the defending side keeps both pawns on the same diagonal as we saw in Averbach's idea it is a draw then he says with the knight pawn and the central pawn which we were having a look uh Cotronius against grievous game the position usually is draw but there are winning chances if the knight pawn is not far advanced and the attacking bishop controls its promotion square so what he is talking about he's talking about this position uh let me um set it up so he's talking about this position we had it here and here this position you remember right so the king is gonna be somewhere here on c7 i think we had exactly this position the bishop was here and the king was here and black was to move so this is the position he is talking about from Andorra. Okay, I mean, I, I don't know. I cannot know everybody, unfortunately. Pretty sure he's a very strong guy. But he was talking about this pawn when it's not on B, B5. Let's say it's on B2. Yeah, and I tried to say this might be some winning chances for the stronger side. Hi, he cut. What do you need help? And uh, he also mentions that if pawns are separate by three files with a knight pawn there are some drawing uh, chances with the rook pawn the position is usually one and uh, if the pawns are separate by four files the ending is usually winning because the attacking king gets between the pawns 
So the final position I was showing to you, it was exactly the same. Exactly the same, these four lines. Uh, ah, wait a second, where is it? New analysis. Uh, where do I upload it? Okay, here, yeah, here. I was uh, meaning about this position, right? So we have one, two, three, four, at least four lines between the pawns. And uh, should be a winning position, right? Anyway, I mean, I will be very happy to answer some final questions. I've... What? what to play against sicilian i'm gonna direct you to my database <laughs> oh there you go mobot immediately posted this i wow that's a nice coincidence i didn't do this actually look at that mobot knows there you go that's my anti-sicilian approach what is what to play against sicilian you play anti-sicilians uh, i'm uh, recommending uh, various setups against uh, um, Nidorf. Yeah, Mobot. Mobot really does it work. Does it does its job, right? Uh, Rosalimo against uh, C5 Knight C6 and the Baltic creation against the Paulson E6. Yeah, just check out the site. Uh, there are some databases, and uh, if you like them, please purchase them. I, I'm quite happy very happy about the quality of the databases and there is a fourth database coming about the Karakan exchange variation I just don't know when I'll have the time to finish this it's been sitting on the same level for some like four months I just don't have the time I'm almost almost finished I mean I think I already did a, a bootcamp about this um, so e4 c6 d4 d5 takes takes it was one of my boot camps the exchange caracan uh so i short uh, sort of shared with the ideas but hitchcock if you want some very quick tips i did the boot camps also against the sicilians please check my previous uh, uh sessions you can go to my youtube channel here i'm gonna type the command uh, there you're gonna find various playlists uh, please find GM Nations bootcamp that's me and one of the very early um, one of the very early bootcamps maybe first second third I don't remember already was about various anti-Sicilian approaches yeah sure sure uh, it's gonna be like an intro of course it's not gonna be an encyclopedia approach but if you like the rising positions, yeah, I'll happy, of course. Uh, I'll be happy that it, it will help you. And if you're looking for more, just purchase the database. Right. Okay. So if there are no final questions, I guess I'll finish for today. Quite tired and uh, a winning opening. Uh, I'm afraid there is no such thing as winning opening. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately there is not. Yeah, of course you're welcome and happy that you liked it. Uh, I would like to again mention I'll have my next stream already tomorrow. It's not gonna be on Sunday. I'll make the changes on my Twitch channel. Uh, it, uh, the reason is because I'm flying back home Sunday. I'll be playing in the Finnish league the next two days yeah next friday the next friday i think the next friday is gonna be my boot camp so the next schedule is like this uh tomorrow i'll do blitzing i'll play some internet blitz you can play against me my subs definitely can play against me totally i would love to play against you yeah and uh on monday i'll have another change in the schedule it's because of my partner i'll be partnering with yevgeny miroshnichenko who goes here by the nickname of mironius vulgaris on uh, twitch so we are going to be doing together uh going together for a puzzle survival run 
So that's the plan. But I'll announce it anyway beforehand in the club, in our sub club as well. So you'll know it. You won't miss it. Uh, in Finland, I hope so. <laughs> I hope. I mean, I'm going for the wins. Yeah, definitely. It's going to be two games. One game tomorrow, one day, game after that. Yeah, Miro definitely is fun. He's, he's a great commentator. Actually, I think today, wasn't it? He is doing the commentary for the St. Louis. Wasn't it? Oh, listen, guys, let me check it. I mean, he said he's going to do the commentary for St. Louis. Uh, there is Garrett Kasper of uh, Magnus Carlsen playing. It's quite a historic event, although it's fish random chess. Yeah, the Varetsky is ending manual. Listen, I'll check it very briefly. I'll check it very briefly. I'll switch to the lobby so that uh, you see when is St. Louis. Let me check it. Oh, well, maybe I open it here first. Um, boot camp. Wait a second. Start player? I'm not sure. I'm not sure, really. I mean, let me check. No, no, no. It's live. Listen, it's live. Wait a second. It's live. Saint Louis Chess. But it's not on Twitch. Oh, so they start in five minutes. Okay, guys. I'm pretty sure this is where is Yevgeny Miroslavchenko going to stream. Not, <laughs> probably not, not stream. This is where Yevgeny Miroslavchenko, Mironis Vulgaris, he doing the commentary in English for St. Louis Chess Club. It's really a great, amazing event. I mean, Yevgeny is one of the best commentators in the world. And uh, he's going to do the commentary. Yeah, excellent timing, right? You, you can just make a cup of tea and go for the juice. Yeah, maybe I'll just switch to the other screen so that you can properly find it. And uh, yeah, so in five minutes it starts. So please say hello to Yevgeny if he is following the, uh, the commentary. I think he's going to check from time to time. He's a super nice guy super well knowledgeable i mean he knows so many things much more than i do <laughs> and uh me and yevgeny uh we are gonna do together a stream on monday yeah so this is the guy i mean okay as yeah uh those of you who don't know yevgeny Miroshnicheko is one of the world's best commentators and he has been quite often actually in, in this chat in this very chat Right. Okay, guys, I hope you are going to have a great Friday. In three minutes starts St. Louis Rapid and Blitz. I apologize. I cannot really uh, raid uh, this one uh, because it is on YouTube. I just hope you like today's content. And uh, again, I would like to remind I have this very little initiative going on, which is called. Where's. So wait a second. Let me switch it back. Uh, this the goal for the sub games it's slowly going forward and I'm gonna do the sub games together with Yevgeny yeah so this is your chance guys I mean this is the guy who's gonna be commenting St. Louis uh, fish random chess where Magnus Carlsen and, and Gary Casper is gonna be playing I'm gonna be partnering with him and it's gonna be my subs against his subs and we plan to do this in the coming weeks. So there you see there's the goal for the sub games. And the subs, they'll be playing against each other. And me and Yevgeny will be commentating. So imagine this. <laughs> okay, listen guys, it was fun. Think about this and see you already tomorrow. I'll do some proper blitzing tomorrow. Today I'm just tired to, to do blitzing. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> no, 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 we won't play against Yevgeny. We'll destroy Yevgeny's subs. Not Yevgeny, Yevgeny's subs. We destroy his subs, of course, of course. We will destroy Yevgeny's subs. We have to. We have to. <laughs> we have the best subs here. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I can I can imagine. Okay. Have have, have fun, guys. Take care.